Chapter 29 of Life of Dorothea Lynde Dix by Francis Tiffany. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 29 Builds a Monument. With the close of the war came honorable discharge from the service to hundreds of thousands of soldiers, officers, surgeons, and nurses. Home, sweet home, was now the rejoicing air struck up by the regimental bands. To a nature like Miss Dix's, however, this could not be. She had no home. She was a stranger and a pilgrim on the earth. She asked no discharge this side the grave. For her, then, another but still a martial strain must be taken up by drum and trumpet, set to the words of her favorite hymn, A Soldier's Life from Battles Won to New Commencing Strife, A Pilgrim's Restless as the Sun, Behold the Christian's Life. Almost inevitably had it come about, through her duties as superintendent of women nurses, that she should have assumed an immense number of commissions from soldiers dying in hospitals under her charge, commissions which involved large correspondence with their families. Moreover, for hundreds who had been wounded and had ultimately recovered, as well as for large numbers of nurses, who had become invalided in their work and were left poor and unprovided for had she undertaken the role of volunteer pension agent. All this crowded her with work for eighteen months to come. Her authority with the War Department here rendered her services to great numbers of the humble and uninfluential invaluable. No long time went by, however, before her ardent sympathies became enlisted in another work, the work this time of erecting an enduring monument to the memory of the thousands of brave men who lay sleeping their last sleep in the newly established National Cemetery at Hampton, Virginia, near Fortress Monroe. On this, to her hallowed ground, had she received too many dying messages from the soldiers she so loved, not to make the work seem to her a consecrated duty. The first idea of such a monument had been conceived by others, who, either wearying in the task of raising the necessary funds for it, or unequal to doing it, felt that they must transfer the burden to the shoulders of this overtasked woman, who swiftly and gladly took it up. To her it seemed a disloyal outrage that so devout a memorial should not be erected. Few shared so strong a sense of the duty of a nation's enduringly commemorating in bronze and stone its obligation to its martyrs to liberty as the very woman who always refused point-blank to have her own name connected with any of her great works. It is a seeming inconsistency, not uncommon with the order of minds to which she belonged. No doubt John Howard would have subscribed most liberally to a monument for any other philanthropist, while leaving behind, in far away Cherson, the strict order, bury me where I die, and let me be forgotten. The first allusion to any personal connection of Miss Dix with this projected monument is found in a letter to Mrs. William Rathbone, an extract from which will attest the depth of the feelings that have moved the writer to undertake the work. Quote, Washington, D.C., August 18th, 1866. My dear friend, lately I have collected in a quiet way among my friends $8,000 with which to erect a granite monument in a cemetery at Fortress Monroe where are interred more than 6,000 of our brave, loyal soldiers. 
I had a special direction over most of these martyred to a sacred cause, and never forget the countless last messages of hundreds of dying men to fathers, mothers, wives, and children. Never forget the calm, manly fortitude which sustained them through the anguish of mortal wounds and the agonies of dissolution. Nothing, in a review of the past four years' war, so astonishes me as the uniformly calm and firm bearing of these soldiers of a good cause, dying without a murmur as they had suffered without a complaint. Thank heaven the war is over. I would that its memories also could pass away. End quote. Once making herself responsible that the monument should and so necessarily would be built, Miss Dix set to work with her usual energy. She was by nature a builder, and always happier in dealing with those reliable and tangible servants of God, stone and iron, lime and hydraulic cement, rock foundations, than with the hay, wood, and stubble of politicians. She meant that, as a structure, this should be a monument that would tell its story of self-sacrifice for generations to come. With this end in view, weeks were spent by her in visiting quarry after quarry along the sea coast of Maine, till she should find a granite of such imperishable quality as fitly to symbolize to her the granite in the character of the men whose name and fame it was to repeat to their children's children. It promises to stand for centuries unless an earthquake should shake it down, was her own word of happy congratulation when at last the structure stood completed. Contributions now flowed in rapidly in response to the appeals she made, and by December 11th, 1867, all was in such state of forwardness that she could write to her friend Mrs. Torrey, quote, Reaching Washington, I proceeded at once to the Ordnance Bureau to see Major General Dyer, wrote a letter to General Grant, which was signed approved by General Dyer, asking for 1,000 muskets and bayonets, 15 rifled guns, and a quantity of 24-pound shot with which to construct my fence. I am rather gratified that every bill has been paid as soon as forwarded." End quote. So energetically was the work then pushed that early in May 1868, the completed monument was handed over to the care of the United States government and the following letter received from Secretary Stanton. Quote, War Department, Washington City, May 12, 1868. Dear Madam, Inasmuch as by the act of Congress the national cemeteries are placed in charge of the Secretary of War, and under his direction, I accept with pleasure the tender of this memorial to our gallant dead, and return the thanks of the Department to the public-spirited citizens who have furnished the means for erecting it and to yourself for your arduous, patriotic, humane, and benevolent labors in bringing to a successful completion such a noble testimonial to our gallant dead who perished in the war to maintain their government and suppress the rebellion. Yours truly, Edwin M. Stanton, Secretary of War. End quote. In another and less ceremonious vein, now humorously writes to Miss Dix his felicitations her dear old asylum friend, Dr. Isaac Ray. Quote, I congratulate you, he says, on the completion of your monument. With so much stone and iron on your shoulders, I do not wonder you got sick. Pray, do take a lighter load the next time you undertake 
to shoulder other people's burdens, end quote. In the National Cemetery in which this memorial stands, there sleep today, under the shade of the magnolias and cedars, more than 12,000 Union soldiers, to whose ranks each year contributes its fresh quotum from the fast-vanishing inmates of the great soldier's home close at hand. The monument itself is an obelisk of cyanite rising to a height of 75 feet and resting on a massive base 27 feet square. It is enclosed with a circular fence of musket barrels, bayonets, and rifled cannon set in heavy blocks of stone. The impression it makes on the mind is simple, dignified, and martial. On it is set the inscription, in memory of Union soldiers who died to maintain the laws. The first object visible over the low level of the peninsula to vessels coming in from sea to the roads, it stands the reverential tribute of a heroic woman to the heroic men she honored with all her soul. End of chapter 29「Resumes Hospital Work » Her last duties connected with the war at an end, Miss Dix, now sixty-five years old, took up once again her old asylum work never relaxing in the fidelity with which she pursued it, till, at the age of eighty, she retired incapacitated for further service, to the shelter gratefully tendered her by the board of managers of the asylum in Trenton, New Jersey, her firstborn child. That the impoverishment wrought by war in the southern and southwestern states must have left all institutions of charity in a deplorable condition, she was clearly enough convinced. But the old glad welcome with which she had once been cheered in her work there, was it not over forever, love turned to hate, blessing to reviling and cursing? fully had she herself shared the consuming wrath with which sensitive natures were in those days inflamed and unsparingly had she denounced what had seemed to her the wanton wickedness of the action of the south when in the course of her duties as superintendent of nurses she had had to receive back and care for great bodies of union soldiers just released from the southern prisons starved to skeletons and idiotic with the misery they had undergone it had seemed to her in the bitterness of her soul that she could never again shake hands with those she had once so warmly loved great then was her surprise and delight at finding that in her case at least an exception was made to the vindictive feelings inevitably engendered by war the old memories of love and admiration had survived as fresh as ever and the old sense of grateful dependence on her for services no one else could render found immediate imploring expression just as in bygone days yes the condition of things was deplorable all told her but to whom could they look for help but to her from the large number of beseeching letters that now came to her Limitations of space forbid more than the selection of a single typical example, an example, however, which pathetically illustrates the grief felt by devoted friends of the insane over the ruin that had been wrought in the South, and which, at the same time, testifies to the yearning of heart with which their old-time benefactor was looked to for aid. The extracts given are from a letter of Mr. Alfred Huger, of Charleston, South Carolina. 
though not written till the beginning of 1870, the letter shows the thankfulness awakened in so many minds by the bare fact that Miss Dix was now once more on the field. Quote, Charleston, South Carolina, January 31, 1870. My dear madam, I have just heard of your arrival at Columbia. The past, the present, and the future are by this announcement grouped before me. It is the instinct of the afflicted to be aroused and encouraged when your name is mentioned. Ruin and desolation hold their court among us. Our poor little state is sinking under a weight of calamity and of woe. Our temples are draped in mourning, and our hearts are in the dust. Still, we flock to the altar where the high priestess is there. I was one of the founders of the lunatic asylum. Everywhere and at all times I have watched its progress. During the war, I was in daily, almost hourly interchange with our valued friend, Dr. Parker, and with that household of wounded minds over which he presides, and, as we believe, doing so with a holy purpose. Dr. Parker is the father, brother, and friend, the very shield and buckler of our stricken brethren. We have heard like a summons to meet death, of his possible removal. And we have heard also of your providential advent. If the authorities that rule over us select this man as a victim, or if Dr. Parker himself can endure his surroundings no longer, then there is agony upon us. And may we not appeal to you for succor and for help. We look to you, both as the vicegerents of our Father who is in heaven, and we cannot look in vain, and we must not look in vain, and we will not look in vain. Dr. Parker has no equal in our state for the position he occupies. You have no superior, with your mission signed in the high chancery of heaven, and witnessed by angels who do justice and love mercy. In this hour of our trial, a word of information or of consolation from you would be a boon and a blessing. Faithfully and with profound respect, Alfred Huger, end quote. To appreciate the desolation of spirit that finds vent in the above letter, it is necessary to call to mind the actual condition of things then prevailing in South Carolina. The state was under the control of a legislature packed almost solid with brutal plantation Negroes. The influential leaders who swayed them were largely carpetbag politicians from the North, the picturesque title then given to a class of rapacious adventurers whose worldly possessions, consisting solely in an extra shirt and a pair of socks, could hardly as yet aspire to the dignity of a trunk. Later, indeed, they meant to have one, and to have it packed full. What would be the inevitable policy of such a legislature and such leaders toward a state insane asylum can readily be conceived. It would be to put in some ignorant, thievish black as steward, some greedy, half-educated white doctor as superintendent, and in the same way to dispose of the rest of the legitimate spoils of office. The condition of things was worse in South Carolina than in the other southern states. Still, something analogous to this was in danger of prevailing in them all. No wonder, then, that in the misery of his position, Dr. Parker should have written vehemently to Miss Dix in reply to a letter from her counseling patience. Patience, patience. The regents of his asylum were half or two-thirds Negroes. They had apparently got wind of certain of the ways of Europe 
and had made the happy discovery of a new official genius, hitherto unknown, called the pluralist, on the strength of which discovery they had bestowed three offices in the asylum on a single person totally unfit to discharge the duties of any one of them. On Dr. Parker's reporting the delinquencies of the man, the culprit had defiantly written to the regents, quote, Everything will go on well if you, the regents, can have your own way but not if the superintendent is to have his, end quote. Happily, one Negro regent had the good sense to administer, in his own peculiar vernacular, the following sound rebuke, quote, Well, Dr. H., the superintendent is the man to have his way. He is boss, and we will not have two bosses, end quote. At the close of his letter, Dr. Parker says, quote, If anyone can save our cherished institution from ruin, you are the person. End quote. Now, already in the previous two years of 1868 and 1869, had Miss Dix been at work with her old success in the northern and middle states. Spite of war, the national population had been steadily growing. The demands, moreover, on such institutions as the Army and Navy Asylum in Washington had advanced a hundredfold through the vast increase of the military and naval forces. To help to meet all these new exigencies, her energies were taxed to the extreme and at times there comes from her a cry of agony and despair. Resuming once again her old inspection of almshouses and jails, she finds the melancholy condition of things to which she had at the outset called such effective attention, renewing itself through the inadequacy of existing institutions to cope with the growth of population and the tide of immigration. It would seem, she breaks out in sadness to her friend Mrs. Torrey, that all my work is to be done over so far as the insane are concerned. Language is poor to describe the miserable state of these poor wretches in dungeon cells. I did not think I was to find here in this year, 1868, such monstrous abuses. Still encouraging results continue to cheer her. Thus, May 6, 1868, Professor Silliman writes her from New Haven, Connecticut, quote, It is just two years this month since you came here to move this matter, and now the first patients are in the new hospital building. How much we all owe you for your timely aid, courage, and energy without which this noble work would not have been undertaken, certainly for many years. And it was all done so quietly. The springs of influence were touched in a way which shows how possible it is to do great and noble things in public assemblies without a lobby or the use of money." End quote. Equally in Washington does she meet a like success while of Pennsylvania, she can write, quote, Tomorrow I go to the northeastern district of the state to find a farm of 300 acres for a third hospital, for which I have got an appropriation of $200,000. It was well that the encouraging stimulus of yearly success should thus come to the woman nearing the age of 70, on whose shoulders such a burden rested. One by one, she now took up the cause of the many asylums she had founded, laboring indefatigably toward their restoration and enlargement and toward infusing into the minds of new legislatures liberal and rational ideas on the whole subject of the treatment of insanity. From many an old asylum, too, in full tide of prosperity, there now came to her grateful remembrances. Quote, I trust, 
wrote to her in 1871, Mr. John Harper, treasurer of the Dixmont Hospital in Pennsylvania. When the warm weather comes, you will visit Dixmont and see for yourself what a monument for humanity has been erected and put into prosperous operation through your foresight and exertions. Do you remember the day in my room in the bank when you urged the establishment of a new rural hospital and Judge Blank opposed you so bitterly? The judge was a man of great eloquence and influence, but you beat him to his astonishment. End quote. Earlier, too, on the occasion of the presentation of a portrait of Miss Dix to this same Dixmont Asylum by an unknown citizen of Pennsylvania, had Mr. Harper written the donor, quote, You know, sir, in the olden time, each institution sacred to charity had its patron saint. The Dixmont Hospital, notwithstanding our Protestant and iconoclastic ideas, has a patroness whom we respect and love, indeed, who is canonized in our affections quite as strongly as were saintly ladies in the medieval age. The mission of Our Lady is to create those noble institutions which aid in the restoration of the dethroned reason and Dixmont Hospital is one of the jewels which will adorn her crown hereafter. End quote. Enough has now been said to illustrate the nature of the work that was to engage Miss Dix to the end of her active days. Farther to particularize would be but to weary the reader with a bare catalogue of achievements, each indeed fraught with some shape of succor to the miserable, but as a catalogue a mere burden to the mind. From Maine to Texas, from New York to San Francisco, she is henceforth perpetually on the wing. The asylums scattered throughout the length and breadth of the land have become to her her children. How they are faring is the one thought of her heart. Everywhere, on her arrival, the keys of the wards are freely handed to her, and she is allowed to wander round alone. She is recognized as a lunacy commission in herself, so admirable a one, indeed, that even so late a date as 1877, when she was then 75 years of age, Dr. Charles F. Folsom of Boston, Massachusetts, could say of her, in his Diseases of the Mind, quote, her frequent visits to our institutions of the insane now and her searching criticisms constitute of themselves a better lunacy commission than would be likely to be appointed in many of our states, end quote. The inevitable infirmities of age are now growing on her. She is more silent and concentrated, more abrupt and imperative, more the embodiment of habit than of the earlier spontaneity and enthusiasm which once irresistibly swept the legislatures of twenty states before her. But her intellectual perceptions are as clear and acute as ever. Nothing escapes her eye, whether to be commended as meritorious or taken exception to as faulty. No fear or favor sways her a hair. Alike in the asylum of her earliest superintendent friend, or in that of the latest appointee, she feels that it is the question of the best good for the stricken and miserable that is to dominate her own mind and the minds of all. Inevitably was there something trying to the heads of asylums in the sudden and unexpected visitations of this exceptional woman and her equally sudden departures. She was the organized and embodied conscience of the highest ideals of asylum management, 
with a searching power of intellect and character that few could encounter without a lurking feeling of dread. The older members of the profession, who for long years had known the inestimable value of her services to the cause they stood for, understood that no criticism would escape her that was not dictated by the inmost sense of justice and kindness, and farther, that a vast experience lay behind it that would make it worthy of their best consideration. But many of the newer men in the newer states, who knew not Joseph, felt inclined to take exception to the quiet but irresistible air of authority with which this woman, of no outward official position, would arrive, see all and judge all, and perhaps, without a word of comment, leave them feeling that alike the good and bad had been weighed in the scales of even-handed justice. A few even were there who were disposed to make merry over this self-constituted lunacy commission in the person of a single aged woman. The story is told of her once going into an asylum where she called for a trial of the fire extinguishing apparatus. It proved to be out of order and useless, and she spoke some words of stern rebuke. Later, it became the habit of some of the younger doctors, of a supposedly humorous turn of mind, to refer to this incident as furnishing the matter of an exquisitely funny story. Vastly pleasant did they seem to find it to expatiate on the consternation the old lady had caused by her appalling demonstration that the whole elaborate system for saving the buildings from conflagration was absolutely worthless. A vastly amusing story, no doubt, and yet one can hardly avoid charitably wishing that a select few of such humorously-minded young doctors might be compelled to serve an apprenticeship on a canard or white star steamship. What would they witness there? This, that the instant a certain signal is sounded, whether in the dead of night or at break of day, or when dinner or supper is in full tide, every waiter, every bedroom steward, every deckhand, every officer, drops on the spot, whatever he is at, and runs with lightning speed to take his appointed place at the pumps or at the handling of the hose. Should it then turn out, even on this mere formal review, that the fire apparatus would not work, it is easy to imagine the nature of the reception at the captain's hands any responsible officer would get who showed a disposition to regard the miscarriage as a capital joke. Miss Dix had had too fearful experience of insane asylums burning to the ground and of scores of wretched victims perishing, not to feel that such a failure ought to be branded on the spot as guilt and crime. Footnote. Even as this biography is going through the press, there comes from Montreal, Canada, the news of the total destruction by fire of an immense insane asylum there, in which one hundred miserable victims were roasted alive. The asylum was provided with a complete fire extinguishing apparatus. Only, as it turned out, the hose was disconnected from the pumps and the wrench mislaid. Before connection could be made, the flames had got too much headway to be arrested. End footnote. Perhaps then a fairer and more discriminating picture can hardly be drawn of the salutary impression left by these comings and goings of mystics on minds kindred in moral earnestness with her own than is found in the ensuing letter of Mrs. Harriet C. Curlin, wife of the superintendent of the Institution for Feeble-Minded Children at Elwyn, Pennsylvania. Quote, 
among our many visitors, there has never been one so ready to praise the good found and so agreeably to reprove mistakes or failures. This may not always have been her characteristic, but surely we met only the gentle, considerate side of her nature, so that when Dr. Curlin said, Miss Dix, won't you come up to see where our teachers have rooms? Her reply, Oh, no, doctor, I have never found any suffering among officers of an institution, was so frankly and half wittily spoken it carried no offensive sarcasm. If she were found at five o'clock a.m. in an unusual place, watching the early movements of our large family, her kindly manner of telling what she had seen, right or wrong, made us feel that sympathy with the superintendents prompted her desire for as perfect management as possible, and that no spirit of pleasure in spying out wrong had caused her unexpected early walk. She never gossiped about the weakness or faults of others. Her judgment was given with consideration of accompanying circumstances. Her language, voice, and manner were thoroughly gentle and ladylike. Yet so strong was she in intelligence and womanhood that at times I ranked her alone and above all other women. End quote. The picture drawn in this letter of the inexorable fidelity tempered with kindness and gentleness of Miss Dix weighed in connection with the fire apparatus story and her terrible power of rebuke when rebuke was demanded will serve together to call up a vivid idea of the manner of woman she was in these last years of her active life. Pleasanter it no doubt was to receive the visitation of duly appointed state inspectors who would beam graciously and ignorantly on the excellent condition in which they found everything, take a glass of wine in the medicinal room of the establishment, and then adjourn to a good dinner. But this was not Miss Dix's way. From the hour in which the terrible abyss of human suffering had been opened to her, and a sacred voice within had summoned her to consecrate her life to the service of these miserable ones, her faith had never wavered that God had eternally ordained her for this special mission. It was to be no child's play, but a stern and awful ordeal. Every day made it clearer to her that eternal vigilance is the price of justice and mercy toward these outcasts of the world. End of chapter 30「The Last of Earth » Frequent allusion has been made in past chapters to the eagerness with which Miss Dix seized every opportunity to extend the blessings of a rational and humane treatment of insanity into all quarters of the world. Very pleasant, then, is it to narrate one more happy result of these widespread efforts, the knowledge of which came to her as late as in 1875. Years before, when first a chargé des affaires was sent to Washington from Japan to represent its interests before the United States government had she sought his acquaintance and held long and earnest interviews with him on the subject that lay nearest her heart. Fortunately, in Jugoi Arenori Mori, she found a man of great intellectual capacity and large humanity. Readers of this biography will recall the shock produced in the minds of all true friends of Japan by his assassination a year or more ago in his own country at the hands of a fanatic. 
He had by that time become acknowledged as the foremost statesman in his native land. From him came to Miss Dix in 1875 a letter which was one more illustration of the wisdom of a favorite maxim with her, so beside all waters. Quote, Tokyo, Japan, November 23, 1875. My dear Miss Dix, during the long silence, do not think I have been idle about the matter in which you take so deep an interest. I have given the subject much of my time and attention, and have successfully established an asylum for the insane at Kyoto, and another in this city is being built and will soon be ready for its work of good. Other asylums will follow, too, and I ardently hope they will be the means of alleviating much misery. Very truly yours, Arinori Mori. End quote. Two more asylums in faraway Japan, with others very likely to follow, were now to be added to the thirty-two she had already been the instrument of either founding outright or greatly enlarging. She was accustomed to mark each one on a map with the sign of the cross. Could all the prisons on new and better plans she carried bills for, and all the almshouses she caused to be thoroughly reconstructed be added to these, and then all brought vividly before the mind's eye, how amazing would be the impression left. It was noted by benevolent minds in these latter days of Miss Dix's career that whenever any great calamity occurred, like the terrible fires which destroyed such large portions of Chicago and Boston, she was sure soon to appear on the spot with sums of money she had collected from her many friends, and quietly and judiciously searching out for herself where help was most needed, or what persons already on hand could be relied on to expend the fund most wisely, would seek to do her part in mitigating the widespread distress. Not human beings alone, but the brute creation likewise appealed to her unfailing compassion. Thus, among her other projects of relief in these days, was that of setting up a drinking fountain in a densely thronged part of Boston where she had noticed that the draft horses were subjected to the hardest work. It was her application to the poet Whittier to send her the translation of an Arabic inscription cut on the curb of a similar fountain in the east, an inscription the beauty of which had struck her when he had repeated it on a previous occasion, which called out from him the ensuing letter. Quote, Oak No, 18th, 8th Month, 1879. My dear friend, I cannot recall the Arabic inscription I referred to for the fountain, and have written one myself, taking it for granted that the fountain was to be thy gift though thee did not say so. Such a gift would not be inappropriate for one who all her life has been opening fountains in the desert of human suffering, who, to use scripture phrase, has passed over the dry valley of Baca, making it a well. With love and reverence thy friend, John G. Whittier. Stranger and Traveler, Drink freely and bestow a kindly thought on her who bade this fountain flow, yet hath for it no claim save as the minister of blessing in God's name. End quote. Whatever the strength, however, or whatever the power of the inspiring motive, there must come an end to every mortal tether. In October 1881, worn out with fatigue, Miss Dix went for rest to one of her hospital homes, 
the Trenton, New Jersey Asylum, which she was destined never again to leave. Previous to this, the last characteristic glimpse of her is caught in the following account, related by Dr. George F. Jelly, former superintendent of the McLean Asylum. She arrived at my house in Boston, said, in substance, Dr. Jelly, after nightfall, one bitter, snowy winter evening. She seemed chilled to the marrow, and said she would go straight to bed. I offered her my assistance in mounting the staircase, but she declined every aid. The furnace drafts were opened for greater heat. A large fire was kept blazing in the grate of her bedroom. My wife piled five or six blankets on her, and I administered some warming drink. Spite of all, she shivered with cold and would, I felt sure, succumb to pneumonia. She was on one of her tours of inspection, and had ordered the carriage to come for her in the early morning. Nothing could move her to change her plan, and when morning came, she was up and ready to start. It was still a bitter snowstorm. I begged her at least to let me go with her to the station, for I feared she might die before she reached her destination. No, she would go alone. She was used to such things, she said, and as soon as she had got through her work in New England, would go farther south, where she always became better soon. Something pathetic and painful is there in such a narrative of exposure in extreme old age. Something sad and hard to be reconciled to in this refusal of so much as the helping hand of a strong man in mounting the staircase on tottering feet. The refusal, too, by one whose long life had been a ceaseless ministry to others. Still, the anecdote is too characteristic to be omitted, revealing, as it does, such persistence to the end of the indomitable willpower that had led on to such vast achievement. From Trenton, however, there was to be no more going forth. Those thousand-mile journeys from Halifax to Texas, from New York to San Francisco, were now over forever. To the great credit of the managers of the New Jersey State Asylum, no sooner was it known that Miss Dix was seriously ill in the asylum, and unlikely ever again to be strong enough to leave it, than they called a meeting and passed a unanimous vote, inviting her to end her days under the roof of the institution she had founded as its loved and revered guest. The managers of this institution had always manifested toward her singular gratitude and respect. Roomy and comfortable apartments were assigned her, where she preferred they should be, under the pediment of the great Greek portico which forms the façade of the main building, apartments commanding a superb view of the park-like grounds, the open country, and the beautiful sweep of the Delaware River. The private resources of Miss Dix would at this time have amply sufficed to maintain her in comfort during her declining years, but it was an indication of her high self-respect of character that she should have felt the fitness of thus ending her days as the honored guest of one of the many institutions she had founded rather than in any private house. For half a century she had had no home, but had been in every fiber of her being a public character. The asylums were her children, and that, when worn out and incapacitated for farther service, one of these children should thus take her and care for her beneath its roof-tree, seemed to her but in the natural order of family love and duty. Moreover, the passion of doing for others 
had become absolute in her nature. She had a large list of dependents for whose wants she was always providing, and the one luxury that remained to her was the power of being able to continue this to the end. Beyond the grave, even, stretched the longing to be still of use on earth. An intense solicitude had now taken possession of her to preserve unbroken the capital of her property and to leave it in trust so that the income of it should be devoted in perpetuity to charitable objects. Thus the instinct of saving, which in extreme old age is the almost invariable accompaniment of human nature, assumed in her case the character of what had ever been the master passion of her life. For more than five years, Miss Dix was now destined to linger on in her hospital home. They were years of great suffering from exhaustion, and the pain of the steadily advancing disease of which she died, ossification of the lining membranes of the arteries. Imprisonment within the narrow walls of her rooms came doubly hard to her, as always to overpoweringly active natures. Still, no complaint escaped her lips. It was all right it should be so, she said. It was God's will, only it was hard to bear. Life had at no period seemed child's play to her, but a stern though merciful ordeal. Her Bible and collections of sacred poetry were now her stay and comfort. In hymns, especially, the utterance of the suffering and triumphant ones of all the ages, she heard the voices that came home to her with the greatest power and peace. Never a letter she wrote to dear friends with trembling hand that did not contain some of these cherished lines. Meanwhile, old friends did not forget her. From far places they would travel to spend an hour with her, while the older superintendents of asylums kept her duly informed of all that was going on in the world in which she had so long lived, or sent her from their annual meetings greetings of respect and love. A few of the letters that came to her in the asylum home will serve to make vivid the nature and sweetness of the consolations that helped her through these last five years of imprisonment, weariness, and pain. They came in great numbers, alike from private and well-known persons. December 31st, 1882, writes nightly Dr. Kirkbride as follows. Quote, in three hours more, 1882, will belong to the past. May that which follows it bring to you, my most valued and honored friend, all the happiness that can come from a life devoted to good works and to the relief of the afflicted. End quote. Shortly after, comes greeting from her once pupil and lifelong friend, Mrs. John Kebler of Cincinnati. Quote, I never think of you as grown old. You always come to me as I knew you first, crowned with rich brown hair, the like of which no one else ever had. Of all your pupils, I am sure none loved you as I did and do. Few days of all my life have been unblessed by loving, grateful thoughts of the gracious, graceful teacher and friend. Always oh, shall I connect with you, if I remain longer than you, that lovely hymn of Whittier, and my prayer shall be, Still, let thy mild rebukings stand between me and the wrong, and thy dear memory serve to make my faith in goodness strong. End quote. May 6th, 1882, arrives a remembrance of cheer and consolation from Mr. Whittier himself. Quote, Oak Knoll, Danvers, Massachusetts. 
my dear friend, I am glad to know that thou art with kind friends and as comfortable as possible under the circumstances. Thou hast done so much for others that it is right for thee now, in age and illness, to be kindly ministered to. He who has led thee in thy great work of benevolence will never leave thee nor forsake thee. With a feeling of almost painful unworthiness, I read thy overkind words as regards myself. I wish I could feel that I deserve them, but compared with such a life as thine, my own seems poor and inadequate. But nonetheless do I thank thee for thy generous appreciation. May the blessing of our Father in heaven rest upon thee, dear friend. Believe me always and gratefully, thy friend, John G. Whittier. End quote. Of course, so old and tried a friend, so kindred a spirit with her own in love and sacrifice, as Reverend William G. Eliot, D.D. of St. Louis, did not forget her now in her loneliness and pain. From his many letters, let the following short extract and accompanying lines serve to show the loving tenor. Quote, we think and speak of you very often, and in spirit I spend many hours with you daily. Last night, young Mr. Nichols, grandson of your old friend in Portland, was here, and we talked of you an hour. After he left me, I wrote these lines before going to bed. They are a part of the truth, the whole of which cannot be told. If love and gratitude and prayer could save you from all suffering and anxiety, no pain nor loneliness of feeling would ever reach you. Dear sister, in thy lonely hours of suffering and pain, take comfort. The ten thousand prayers cannot ascend in vain from hearts which thou hast comforted, and homes which thou hast cheered, and children saved from ignorance, whose pathway thou hast cleared, from loyal hearts and homes, wherever they are found, and palaces and cottages, with peace and honor crowned. Dear sister, thou art not alone, God's angels hover near, his presence is thy sure defense, then what hast thou to fear? The good fight thou hast nobly fought, and truly kept the faith. The crown awaits thee, sister dear, the victory over death. Take courage then, dear friend, the prize is almost won. Hark, tis the Savior's voice we hear, servant of God, well done. Your brother friend, W. G. Eliot. End quote. Similar testimonials of love and veneration from men and women foremost in all good works throughout the country, as well as from kindred spirits on the other side of the Atlantic, might be indefinitely multiplied. Let them conclude, however, with an extract from a letter of one of the younger men in the battle of humanity, General S. C. Armstrong, a man who, brave as the bravest throughout the war for the preservation of the Union, as soon as peace sounded, beat his sword into a plowshare and his spear into a pruning hook, and thenceforth labored with the zeal of an apostle to make self-respecting and useful American citizens out of the ignorant and degraded Negro freedmen. In his first effort to reduce to order the chaos and anarchy of the whole region about Hampton, Virginia, and to establish an industrial and Christianizing school of instruction there, he had found no stancher friend or wiser adviser than Miss Dix. Quote, you are one of my heroes, he now wrote to her in her last retreat. My ideal is not one who gives the flush and strength of youth to good work, 
for who can help doing so when a chance opens? He is a traitor who declines the chance, just as is he who doesn't fight for his country when it needs him, and he can possibly go. But you kept in the field long past your best days. Your grit and resolve have been wonderful. Faithfully yours, S. C. Armstrong. End quote. Two years after the death of Miss Dix, there appeared in the New York Home Journal of September 11, 1889, an article embodying reminiscences of her traits of character and of incidents in her career. It was from the pen of a valued personal friend of her earlier years, Mrs. S. C. P. Miller. The picture drawn in it of these last days of Miss Dix's life in her asylum home is at once so touching and so stamped with that exceedingly rare endowment of human beings, the power to see what is actually before their eyes, as to render it a positive addition to any attempt to interpret her character. Quote, Accidentally meeting, says Mrs. Miller, an old-time friend from Washington, she mentioned a recent visit to Miss Dix. Eagerly inquiring about her, I learned that she was a confirmed invalid, occupying apartments in the insane asylum at Trenton, which had been given to her by the state of New Jersey in acknowledgment of her agency in securing the erection of the building. At the earliest moment, I went over to see her, sending up my card, with much misgiving as to her memory of me. Immediately, I was taken to her rooms in the tower. She was glowing in her welcome. I told them to bring you right up, for I was so impatient to see my friend that I would not wait a minute. She was propped up in bed and greatly altered. She was unable to walk, and for several years had not even been carried outside of her own rooms, and to this utter helplessness were added paroxysms of intense pain. The doctor does not encourage me to hope that I shall ever be better, she told me, but he comforts me with the assurance that I am in no danger of ever losing my reason. She was curious to know whether I would have recognized her, so curious indeed as to embarrass me in the reply that I should not have done so in an unexpected meeting. I seized the occasion to say, You should be at the pains, Miss Dix, to arrange that you go down to posterity and that beautiful portrait of you in the Athenaeum at Boston. A smile of satisfaction brightened her face at the suggestion, and I was amused to see that even the good and great, the strong and old, possessed, in common with their weaker sisters, a keen relish of a gentle insinuation of personal beauty. It was evident to me that her helplessness did not extend either to her head or hands for soon i saw that her warmest interest was still flowing in its long accustomed channel and that from her sick room lines of communication ran in every direction to the outside world she spoke of the gift made to her of her rooms with much gratification her sense of home seemed wholly centered in them the cozy little bedroom opened into a small bright parlor from the windows of which was an exquisite view of the grounds and distant landscape. Are you strong enough, I asked her on one occasion, to use your pen as in former times? Summoning the nurse, she had some loose sheets handed to me, saying, I wrote these and had them printed by the Indian boys at Hampton, but blank, I can't hold lines long in my memory. They were short hymns, 
and her difficulty was to frame a verse and hold it in mind until she could get it on paper either by her own hand or that of another. Footnote. A favorite occupation of Miss Dix throughout life was the writing of hymns. They were devout, heroic, pleading, and submissive, but she possessed in no marked degree the lyric faculty. And footnote. She was unfeignedly interested in good work done by other hands, and her manner in discussing it, that of the fellow laborer, not of the master workman. I never descried the faintest soupçon of such assumption, nor did I ever detect any personal ambition in her great work. She never sought notoriety, not even in the seclusion of her last years, when it would have been so natural for her to entertain me with the exciting scenes of her previous history, did she ever drag in her past enterprises and successes. Present work seemed to fill her mind, not her former triumphs. Of course, her friendliness extended to my family. I took my daughters to see her, and under the impulse of her ruling passion, she inquired what schemes of usefulness entered into their young lives. One of them detailed to her the effort she was making to benefit the children in her church. On a subsequent visit, months afterward, she asked how it went on. I pictured its progress with some warmth, she listening sympathizingly and now and then nodding approvingly, when she suddenly exclaimed with a beaming smile, I know S. would like to have her fingers in my purse, now wouldn't she? I promptly declined any gift, telling her she already had objects enough of her own to prosecute. But she would not be denied, and a crisp new note so large that I protested against it, was sent with the message that all the agencies of charity, the school, was the most hopeful. It is a mistake that age has power to cast out the evil instincts of human nature. It often intensifies them. Anger and bitterness scowl along the twilight of many a brilliant career, as the dark clouds gather upon the evening horizon of some exquisite day. With Miss Dix, this was not so. Her heated, excited day merged into a quiet, peaceful close. In the full tide of work, she had been called imperious and arbitrary. These traits may have been necessary, Certainly they were powerful aids in the accomplishment of her splendid designs. But as the night drew on, her character mellowed, and all that was most lovable in her nature appeared as her life slowly faded away. She suffered at times agonies of pain, and her ability at self-entertainment lessened rapidly in the last year. She had become extremely deaf. Her sight also was much impaired, and in her increasing bodily feebleness I imagine that her well-stored memory, from which she had drawn so largely for her comfort and refreshment, now often deserted her. Kind friends sought to aid her failing senses by the best helps that science could supply, but in vain. It was pitiful to have her say to me, Try to put this tube in my ear, so as not to pain, and yet allow me to hear what you say. And of her eyes, too, she said in a sort of despairing attempt at cheerfulness, I do not think it right to get such numbers of spectacles that nobody else can use, and which do me no good. I saw her only a few months before her death, when she had become so weak as to allow me to stay only half an hour. Feeble as she was, however, with that singular thoughtfulness for others which never left her, 
she endeavored to entertain the daughter I had brought with me. As the interview wore on, it became evident to me that she wished to say something confidential, and at her suggestion I tried to maneuver the faithful nurse out of hearing. Failing ignominiously, I said, Oh, never mind now. Tell me when I come again. Ah, uh, yes, if I am here, if I am here. Oh, I replied, quite too warmly, I feared, to meet her wishes, for I thought death would be welcomed by her. Oh, I hope you will be here for many a year to come. She started up with agitated eagerness and said with wild excitement, My dear friend, if you hope that, pray for it. Pray that I may be here. I think even lying on my bed I can still do something. She fell back upon her pillow exhausted, whilst I, moved and surprised beyond measure, sat down that she might have time to recover her composure. I then rose to go. She threw her arms round me, saying with unwanted tenderness, Oh, darling! And I had parted with my old friend forever. S. C. P. Miller, Princeton, New Jersey. End quote. Constant touches throughout this narrative reveal in Mrs. Miller the genuine observer. With the second childhood of extreme old age and the diminishing power of self-restraint, almost inevitably does vanity prompt the veteran soldier, sailor, statesman, or traveler to give way to the temptation of rehearsing to others the flattering story of the battles or sea fights he has fought or has won, the great debates or perilous adventures in which he has borne a heroic part. Of all this no trace is found in mystics. To her, when a thing is done, it is done. The present absorbs her while it yet offers any good to do. Aged, broken, and full of suffering, still for all her religious faith, for all her yearning after a higher spiritual realm beyond, she does not want to die. I think even lying on my bed, I can still do something. The last exclamation, too, oh, darling, is the one that occurs over and over again in the broken, fragmentary letters she at this period writes to dear friends, proving what a world of tenderness underlay that self-controlled, adamantine character with which she had fronted the world in her long warfare for the outcast and despised. As long as strength lasted, it remained the habit of mystics to sit during the declining hours of sunlight at her window, feasting her eyes on the beauty of the landscape and communing with him, of whom all this visible glory was to her the perpetual manifestation. There below her stretched the park-like expanse of the grounds of the asylum, and there, sitting under the trees or wandering along the paths in the fullest enjoyment of liberty possible to their sad condition, were the poor children of affliction, whose former miseries in chains and cages had first started in her the vow of consecration never to the end to be broken. Now, in contrast, could she look down on them, ministered to by the uttermost that could be done by science, humanity, religion, and the healing charms of nature? And yet in the hours of reverie to which this visible scene must inevitably have led on, how equally distinctly to imagination must there have often risen before her mind's eye, in twenty different states stretching over half a continent in america from the pines and maples of newfoundland to the live oaks and palmettos of louisiana as well as in europe and in faraway japan 
the repetition of the same blessed picture. He whom she had so loved and followed, the Son of Man, who came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, how often in those sacred hours must she have felt the fullness of his benediction. I was and hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. The end came on the evening of July 17, 1887. For a month she had grown steadily weaker. Still with her habitual fortitude, and that desire to pass unobscured through the portal of death so characteristic of believing natures, she had begged her dear friend, Dr. Ward, to avoid the use of anodynes, and to tell her distinctly when the last hour was at hand. This was not to be. Although Dr. Ward had given her his pledge that he would apprise her as soon as he saw the end nearby, it came as unexpectedly to him as to her. He was sitting at the tea table when the nurse suddenly ran down to report that Miss Dix was sinking away. Rapidly mounting the stairs, on opening the door, just as his eye fell on her, she breathed a quiet sigh, and all of earth was over. The burial took place in Mount Auburn Cemetery near Boston, Massachusetts, occurring when, in the height of the summer heats, so many are away at the seashore or in the mountains, a few friends only, among them Dr. John W. Ward, Dr. Charles H. Nichols, and Mr. Horace A. Lamb stood by the grave, communicating to her English friends the intelligence of her last illness and death, Dr. Nichols, who had been so long and intimately associated with her throughout her great career, closed with these words his letter to Dr. D. Hack Took. Quote, Thus has died, and been laid to rest in the most quiet, unostentatious way, the most useful and distinguished woman America has yet produced. End, quote. End of chapter 31chapter 32 of life of dorothea lind dix by francis tiffany this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 32 summary a condensed summary of the incidents and spirit of a career already so fully illustrated as that of miss dix seems hardly called for her story is one that tells itself as it goes along. Still, it may be well in a few words to gather in hand the separate threads and weave them into a combined picture of the essential characteristics of her life and work. The childhood of Miss Dix was, as has been seen, bleak, humiliating, and painful more so, indeed, than it has been deemed needful to record. By the age of twelve, the prematurely thoughtful little girl clearly foresaw that she would have to take into her own hands the problem of her future destiny, as well as of the destiny of her two child brothers. How bitter her earliest experience was, is evident from the fact that never to her dying day would she unlock her lips on the subject to her most intimate friend. At an age, then, when most children are carelessly living in their little world of dolls, the proud and sensitive child keenly felt that she would have to conquer for herself and others a foothold in the world. At once her inborn decision of character displayed itself. 
She ran away from her mortifying and belittling present that she might secure the possibility of a more promising future. Independent she would be, and master of the means of carrying out what was then the strongest desire in the heart of the premature child mother. To fit herself to become a teacher seemed the one way to achieve her purpose. It was the New England ideal of honorable work. It fell in with her own thirst for knowledge, and it opened up a field for forcefully impressing herself on others, always so predominant a trait of her character. Thus, from the start, were the intrepidity and rational clearness of her mind revealed. Underlying, however, this exceptional energy and ambition, there lay a temperament of extreme sensitiveness, of a sensitiveness, indeed, so acute as physically to betray itself all through her girlhood and young womanhood in a quick flushing of the face whenever she was addressed. All her views of life took on an idealistic shape. She craved the society of refined, intellectual, and morally superior people. She reveled in poetry. She was a worshiper of intellectual greatness. She was full of heartbreak for affection. She drank in passionately the religious prophecies of teachers like Channing. And yet her love of knowledge, beauty, and spirituality were at the last remove from selfish absorption in the pursuit of them. Poverty, ignorance, and degradation distressed her as keenly as their opposites allured her, and the moment she could command the means, she began to gather together the children of neglect and misery, to make them sharers in a richer life. Every ideal in her mind thus tended irresistibly to practical benevolent action, the religious fervor of her nature finding vent in enthusiastic personal love of him who went about doing good, and who yearned to make all life a perpetual feast of love and beauty to which from the highways and hedges the outcast should be invited in the wedding garment thrown over their rags and misery. There is, then, no way of understanding the later career of this outwardly so self-sustained and commanding woman, apart from the full recognition of the intensity of an emotional temperament pouring out the molten metal which shaped every lineament in the gradually consolidating bronze statue. This temperament was at once the exaltation and the despair of her youth, and the hiding place of the power of her oncoming days. What kept her sane through the terrible strain of her later years was the relief she got in the passionate love and study of nature, in her power of swiftly kindling to ideal visions of what could and should be made real and in adoring communion with God, through whose help she rested assured all things were possible. Thus, even in the extreme of physical exhaustion, as after her memorable campaign in Scotland, the inextinguishable fervor of her nature leaps up into its old wanted flame the moment she hears of a new field of promise in the island of Jersey. I shall see their chains off, she enthusiastically writes in a letter already quoted in a previous chapter. I shall take them into the green fields and show them the lovely little flowers and the blue sky, and they shall play with the lambs and listen to the song of the birds, and a little child shall lead them. This is no romance. This will all be if I get to the Channel Islands with God's blessing. The romantic ideal, they shall play with the lambs, the splendid self-confidence, if I get there, the devout recognition, 
with God's blessing. Here lay the three root motive powers of the woman. Throughout the schoolkeeping period of Miss Dix's life, the contradictory elements in her nature, intense and even perilous sensibility held down and often trampled underfoot by rigid ascetic willpower, were never really harmonized. Sensibility to ideals dictated for herself and for her pupils a height of consecration to knowledge, duty, and service beyond the possibility of realization, while inflexible will instituted rules and practices which took no count of flesh and blood, and were severe and monastic to an extreme. Periods of exhaustion and irritability, with subsequently the swift advance of threatening pulmonary disease, were the penalty she herself paid. While, in the case of the children, some looked back to their school experience with pain, and others declared that they owed to it the best they had ever been or done in life. With Miss Dix, it ended, as has been seen, in the utter collapse of her physical powers, her mind, however, proudly sustained by the feeling that no sharpness of suffering had ever moved her to flinch, that she had made a home for her younger brothers and launched them on the world, had achieved independence, and finally had set a stamp on large numbers of young lives that would be indelible for good as long as they should live. Next follows the 18 months of extreme illness and languishing in Liverpool, England, the jubilee year of her life, as she always termed it, the period for all its pain and all its near prospect of death, in which she felt she had been permitted the most luxuriously to surrender herself to leisure, beauty, domestic love, and spiritual communion with heaven. It wrought a marked softening and enriching influence on her character. Still, it was destined to be followed on her return to America by the saddest and most disenchanted period of her earthly experience. Reaching home a feeble invalid, her career as a teacher over, Lonely and with no distinct prospect before her for the future, she felt herself an exile in her own land. Now first came to her the unifying power, which was to fuse into one harmonious whole the contradictory elements of her nature. Once she was brought into contact with the abyss of human misery opened up and the condition of the outcast insane in Massachusetts, and, as she soon discovered, all over the Union, then forthwith in the overpowering call of God to dedicate herself to their championship, she became revealed to herself and revealed to others. Had she stood and simply gazed down into that abyss of woe, it would have paralyzed so sensitive a nature. But high above all the moaning and despair, she heard the angel song of the new gospel of glad tidings of great joy to them that sat in darkness, revealed to the world through the humane inspiration of such sons of consolation as Pinnell and Took. To the fervid apostleship of this, to her, New Jerusalem descending like a bride from the heavens, would she consecrate her life. Look on this picture, and on this, was henceforth the pole star of her guidance. Here then, it at once became clear, was a nature demanding a large field on which to deploy its forces, forces which shut up to anything lesser must inevitably have preyed on herself and preyed on others. Now could she plan great enterprises. 
Now could she measure her indomitable moral will against the apathy and selfishness of whole legislatures, and finally kindle in their hearts the enthusiasm of humanity. Now could she command and dispose of enormous pecuniary resources, the outcome of public taxation. Now could she cause in twenty states vast structures to rise out of the ground which should take into the merciful keeping of their quiet, beauty, and skill those heretofore chained, scourged, and pinched with cold. Now could she create the national conditions of a great school of insanity and open a career to the eminent men who were destined to carry so far the name and fame of her native land. No wonder she grew happier. She was made for such happiness. No wonder she grew healthier. The caged and drooping eagle in her nature was now afloat on the great spaces in which alone it could find vigor and joy. Then forthwith was it seen how the very powers, the excess of which had been faults in a more restricted sphere, proved the exact means to her great ends. The very persistency of will, which exercised on minor matters, had often been trying to others, now took the leadership of the forlorn hope, and became the assurance of victory on victory making strong men, like her friend Dr. Butolf, write her, I have learned from you never to despair. The very self-confidence which, shut up to little things, might easily have been characterized as assumption, now inspired her to seemingly impossible feats of moral daring, which became their own splendid justification. The very asceticism which exerted in a round of trivial duties had been injurious to mind and body now became power to endure hardness as a good soldier of Christ, the spur to scorn delights and live laborious days. The very reticence which, in social life, had proved a barrier to closer intimacy and often had defeated the craving for affection so intense in her self-repressed nature, now enabled her to hold her own counsel, and while the repository of the secret history of two-thirds of the asylum in the land, never in a single instance to betray confidence. Finally, that very yearning to relieve misery, and that passionate wrath over its longer existence, which left to themselves would either have unnerved or have consumed her, now became the reacting motive to plunge into practical work and achieve mastership over every detail of hospital construction and hospital management. The marvelous series of campaigns of pure humanity won by this single-handed woman and resulting in the establishment of such a host of asylums has already been sufficiently described. Imagination is feeble to call up the extent and enduring character of this her work. It is only by one who has journeyed over the many states of the Union and seen with the bodily eye the enormous structures and park-like grounds she, with the wand of her moral genius made to start out of the earth that it can be adequately conceived. Then first the beholder feels the force of the words written her as far back as 1850 by President Fillmore. Quote, Except my sincere thanks for the print of the hospital for the insane in Tennessee. When I looked upon its turrets, and recollected that this was the thirteenth monument you had caused to be erected of your philanthropy. I could not help thinking that wealth and power never reared such monuments to selfish pride as you have reared to the love of mankind. End quote. 
It will be recalled from previous chapters how frequently the impression made by the absolute consecration of Miss Dix to her work had led many superintendents and private benefactors of asylums all over the land to speak of her as Our Lady, Our Patron Saint. A strain of medievalism, certainly not very common in practical, unimaginative America. Indeed, in a memorial notice written after her death by Dr. Daniel Hacktook of England, the same idea recurs when, in alluding to his own visit to America, he says, quote, The writer has observed, in at least one asylum chapel, the portrait of this saintly woman on the wall where in a Roman Catholic church the Virgin Mary would have been placed. End quote. None can doubt that had she lived in earlier ages of the world, her works of mercy would have led to her actual canonization, and that, on the altarpieces of churches, her halo-crowned figure, marked by some especial symbol, would have become as familiar a sight as those of St. Catherine of Siena or Santa Barbara. Surely, the poor dazed and broken minds of the demented could invoke from a higher realm no more merciful or prevailing spirit. It is, however, an admirable custom in the Roman Catholic Church that, whenever its prelates are summoned to deliberate the momentous question of adding to the sacred calendar a new name, one out of their number should be appointed to enact the part of what is termed the advocatus diaboli, or devil's advocate. His duty it is to rake out of every hidden quarter and every unguarded hour of life the worst that can possibly be urged against the candidate for canonization. A world-old idea this, one already imaginatively glorified as far back as in the days of the book of Job, where, before the court of God and his angels, appears Satan, the adversary, to challenge the name of the man pronounced perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. In the light of the frailty of human nature, even at its best estate, the custom let it be repeated, is an admirable one, and one that falls in with every natural instinct of justice, only with the needful proviso that the preternatural acuteness of the adversary for discovering spots even on the face of the sun shall not be suffered to outweigh the entire mass of counter-testimony to the fact that, after all is said, the sun remains a resplendent luminary. The only serious faults that were ever urged against the character of Miss Dix were that, in minor matters, many people thought her too much inclined to take the reins into her own hands, too inflexible and dictatorial in her treatment of the judgment of others, and that at times her self-consciousness was oppressive. These were instinctive elements in her nature, manifest from childhood. In reality, without the strong taproot in her being from which they sprang, she could never have achieved her enormous work. They are elements of character, the praise or blame of which turns wholly on what other qualities of mind are allied with them. United with clear ideas and noble purposes, they lead on to grand results. And it is only when bound up with narrow thoughts and petty personal ends that they prove morally censurable. No great character can keep always at its high water mark. There comes times of exhaustion and disenchantment, when the higher qualities of the intellect and soul are in abeyance, and the automatic habit of the underlying native temperament alone asserts itself. Emphatically, the automatic habit 
of Miss Dix's nature was that of imperial command, the instinct of taking into her own hands the decision of momentous questions involving the welfare or misery of thousands, and of undauntedly insisting, no matter in the face of whom, in the face of legislature, Congress, Parliament, or Pope, this way in the name of the father of the fatherless, this way and no otherwise shall it be. For it, thousands and tens of thousands, who elsewise would have continued to languish in misery, had occasion to rise up and call her blessed. That this great title set of a powerful nature should at times in minor matters, and when no large idea was longer present, have swept persistently on, was a fault of character of which, when the most is made, no serious detraction from her greatness remains. The older superintendents of asylums, who recognized the immense debt of obligation under which they lay to her, smiled good-humoredly at such trifling peculiarities, knowing full well what a strong hold justice and mercy ever maintained in her heart and that it was after all a godly jealousy for the sacred name of the institutions she yearned over that made her so insistent that no jot or tittle should pass from their law the faults then of the character of miss dix belonged to the class of what have been aptly named the faults of one's virtues that is, they grew out of the excess of good and great qualities. The phrase is a most significant one. Not that a fault does not still remain a fault, and a virtue a virtue, and yet it would be but the barest justice to add that of all her feats of dominating obstacles, the greatest feat of them all was the success of with which through long, long years she dominated the extremes of her own sensitive, fiery, and commanding spirit. Throughout her whole asylum life, it was her struggle, and almost always successful struggle, to hide the imperious element in her nature under the cover of an unfailing patience, sweetness of persuasion, and utter sinking of self in the cause of the poor outcasts for whom she was pleading. I perceive, wrote to her President Fillmore in 1850, during her long struggle in Washington, that you feel anxious and sad. I cannot wonder at it. I wonder your patience has held out so long, and that you can speak with such equanimity but yours is a goodness that never tires a benevolence that never wearies a confident hope that never seems to desert you none but the most disinterested and self-sacrificing can have such faith or display such all-conquering perseverance did then Persons at times accuse her of being interfering and dictatorial in smaller matters? Be it so. She had come heroically by the fault, even when it was a fault. For by what had it been bred in her? Simply by this, that all through her long and self-sacrificing public career of over forty years it had been the very burden of God laid on her shoulders to interfere now with brutal almshouse keepers, now with a low and besotted state of public opinion, now with selfish politicians, now with narrow partisan legislatures, yes, and to persist in interfering till the voice of justice and mercy prevailed. Surely such virtues were resplendent enough to swallow up in their light the few faults of her virtues. 
The prescribed limits of this biography forbid the introduction here of the grateful and detailed tributes paid after her death to the memory of Miss Dix at the annual convention of the Association of Superintendents of American Insane Asylums as well as embodied in the yearly reports of the many and vast institutions she had founded. With scarcely the faintest note of dissent, they were in one vein of praise and veneration. It was for the judgment of the competent that she alone ever cared, and the seal of this was indelibly stamped on her name and work. Had she taken thought of mere personal fame, and yielded to the constant appeals of governors and state legislatures, her name carved in stone would be read today over the portals of more stately structures than were ever from the foundation called after any private man or woman. As it was, the Dix Ward of the McLean Asylum, Somerville, Massachusetts, and Dixmont Hospital, Pennsylvania, are the only institutions where, except for her portrait hanging in so many of their chapels, there is anything visible to suggest her name. Very pleasant is it, however, to round off this summary of the more public characteristics of so salient a character with the notice of a more private trait peculiarly feminine in its nature, a straw perhaps, but still a straw which reveals the main set of the current of a life dedicated to going about doing good. Although herself an unmarried woman, who in early life had met a blight of her affections after an engagement with a cousin, Miss Dix retained till late in her days a romantic fondness for bringing together those she thought fitted to make loving helpmates to one another, and then leaving it to the elective affinities to complete the process of domestic attraction and cohesion. In this eager disposition of the woman who had never known the blessedness of a home of her own to enact the part of special providence in securing a happy home for others, her judgment again and again proved as clear as her heart was warm one series of letters was there left among her papers from a superintendent and his wife both long since dead and whom none now living can name that were one continuous chant of benediction to the lady bountiful who had so tenderly and delicately brought them together and secured them nineteen years of unbroken domestic love. Innumerable likewise, as illustrating the purely womanly side of Miss Dix's nature, were the letters from sick rooms and homes of bereavement, containing each some such endearing message as, In this I place a couple of heartsease blossoms from our garden. They seem to me peculiarly your flower. End of chapter 32 Recording by Phyllis Vincelli End of Life of Dorothea Lynde Dix by Francis Tiffany